Good afternoon. Uh, we are uh, delighted to welcome uh, in our midst uh, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam. Uh, Arvind is uh, Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, has been since 2014, prior to which he was a, a Dennis Weatherston Senior Fellow at Peterson Institute and Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. Prior to that, Arvind was uh, an economist with IMF and is uh, widely renowned for being a very thoughtful scholar on uh, India and China and uh, the emerging uh, world. He's widely published uh, in all the major econ e economics and policy journals. Uh, Arvind has a DPhil and an MPhil from the University of Oxford, economics honors from St. Stephen's, but I guess his most important degree is he's a graduate of our school, PGP batch of 1981. And uh, I notice in the audience several of our seniors, some of whom have celebrated their 50th uh, year of graduation here, and some others who are batches around our events, and I think we are all very proud of you and welcome you back here. Uh, Erwin will be talking with us today uh, on the subject, the surprise that is the Indian economy. And in true uh, IIMA style, he has said uh, he will speak for a little while, 30, 40 minutes we've requested him. And then he, will try, he would love to engage in discussions Q&A. So without further ado, Erwin, please welcome. Professor uh, Ashish Nanda, uh, Professor Basan, Professor D'Souza, <clears throat> um, all of you in the audience, distinguished guests. Um, I see some, uh, at least one old uh, face I remember from here, Professor Morte, who uh, uh, it's lovely to see you here, sir, in our midst. Um, I am obviously delighted to, to be here uh, back in, uh, uh, on campus. Um, I am coming here for the first time after uh, th 36 years. It uh, brings back uh, great memories. I mean, just to, just to enter the LKP Plaza is, is something that's uh, quite a thrilling, thrilling experience. Um, of course, uh, one carries with one lots of memories of this place. Uh, not all good, some mostly good, but some also, uh, which may be more due to the fact that we were also unformed and, and raw in those days, uh, but it's really wonderful to be back, um, and I'm uh, very grateful to Professor Nanda and uh, uh, Professor Chinmay Tambe also, uh, who is uh, instrumental in my coming here. Um, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, which I am. Uh, I also am, uh, you know, by, by aptitude and vocation and, and, and kind of, uh, 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 passion, uh, an economist and a researcher. And um, so today what I thought I'd do is um, share some of the um, findings from uh, the latest uh, piece of output that my team and I sitting in the Ministry of Finance uh, have produced. So <clears throat> if I were to ask you what does the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India do, um, I I'm sure many of you will have uh, you know, notions about what he does. Uh, probably many of you think he does nothing at all. Uh, uh, probably some of you think that, you know, he hangs around somewhere in Delhi and, you know, does some things. But uh, I have to tell you, it's actually really a very, very exciting job. And one of the most exciting things, in fact, the only, I think, requirement of a chief economic advisor, the, the actual requirement, is to produce this document every year called the Economic Survey of India. This is a document that um, is tabled to Parliament uh, the day before the budget, the, immediately the day before the budget. So people anticipate this document um, because they think it's going to give a sense for what the vision of the government is, what the priorities are, and maybe even what the budget next day might include uh, in it. Uh, so, so the um, in some ways, the effectiveness or of, of an economic advisor 
is judged by the correlation between the survey and the budget. So if the budget completely ignores the survey, then they know this, this is a guy who's you know, off on his own doing things, and the government doesn't listen to him. Or, or if there's a good correlation, they draw the inference that actually he's a very influential guy. I think both are uh, probably not right. The truth lies somewhere in between. But uh, just producing this document uh, uh, is, is an enormously uh, inspiring task for at least one reason. I was uh, 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 a year and a half ago, two years ago, in Srinagar uh, presenting this survey. So one of the things I like to do is to write the survey and then to go out, uh, uh, especially to go and meet young people to you know, give them a sense of what the Indian economy is doing. So I was in, uh, in, in Srinagar uh, two years ago presenting the survey when uh, the finance minister of Jammu and Kashmir, his name is Dr. Hasib Drabu, he was introducing me and he turned to me and said, do you know who did, who tabled the first economic survey of India in parliament? And I was stumped. Um, of course, being the cheeky guy that I was, uh, uh, I had to meet the president of India a, a few months later, uh, who is a veteran of the finance ministry and, I, and, and a veteran of many, many governments, uh, you know, the, the ultimate survivor, someone might call him. Uh, and I asked him this question, you know, do you know who tabled the first uh, economic survey to parliament? He didn't know, uh, so I felt slightly better when uh, I realized I didn't know either. Uh, so, and the answer to that question is, the first uh, economic survey was tabled by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, uh, and you know, just that thought makes my hair stand on end that you know, you're part of this amazing tradition that goes back to, to Pandit Nehru. Um, so, so, and I think it was during the Indochina war, there was no finance minister, and the prime minister was, I think, deputing as, as the finance, the, the prime minister was acting as finance minister, so I think he tabled uh, this document in parliament. So, it's a big responsibility. Um, it's something that, uh, it's traditionally been known, uh, seen to be a somewhat of a, a, a dry document, because, I mean, economics is, up to a point, a dry, boring discipline, but we have to make it come alive, and you know, let's see whether I can make it come alive for you today. So um, there's a lot in the survey, and I'm, uh, you know, I would urge all of you to read it, um, keep it by your bedside, and kind of you know, a chapter a day to go to sleep. Um, and, and, but what I'm going to uh, do today is to tell you some of the more <clears throat> interesting and exciting things uh, that, that we found in the course of the survey. So how does the Indian economy surprise? I'm, you know, I hope all of this will be a surprise to you because it was a surprise to me, uh, even for someone like me who's been kind of studying the Indian economy for some time. So um, <clears throat> what should an economic survey aspire to? And this is something that you know, I've thought about a lot, and, um, and I really think that this is a message I'd like to transmit to all of you as well because it has, more <clears throat> it has wider appeal than for just economists alone. This is a famous quote of John Maynard Keynes, uh, you know, probably the greatest economist in the last 200 years. Uh, <clears throat> he was asked, what is uh, a, a, the quality of a good economist? And he made the following very uh, uh, astute observation. He said, actually, if you think about it, compared to mathematics or science, economics is not very demanding in terms of you know, uh, a, a discipline. You know, I, I think scientists and mathematicians are, you know, so much smarter than economists. You know, I still remember Dr. Mote's class, and you know, just to see him there, you felt, wow, he knows so much more, and will always know so much more than I will. Uh, uh, being, uh, you know, having that fine, fine intellectual ability that economists, that mathematicians have. But Keynes said the paradox is that even though economics is not a very dis demanding discipline, actually you have very few good economists. That's the puzzle. And so he, he, from there he went on to say, what are the qualities of a good economist? And I've just transposed that to what a good economic survey should contain. It must possess a rare combination of gifts. It must draw upon, he was, remember he was talking about economists, so you can substitute the it with the he or she, uh, see how gender biased I am. Um, he must draw upon mathematics, history, statesmanship and philosophy in some degree, so multifaceted. It must, he must understand symbols and speak in words, so that he must be good with you know, mathematics and with writing. Uh, he must study the present in the light of the past for the purposes of the future. 
he must be purposeful and disinterested in a simultaneous mood. So, so I mean, it's a bit like the Bhagavad Gita, you know, you engage but also disengage completely. Its authors as aloof and incorruptible as artists, you must have that distance, and yet sometimes as near to earth as grubby politicians, right? You know, so you must be able to kind of engage fully, be fully part of the hurly-burly of policy making, yet be able to distance yourself and say, you know, uh, I want to be objective, dispassionate, uh, and so on. So I think this is actually uh, the qualifications for a good economist. Uh, it is, I, I would argue, also the qualifications for all of you who will go on to you know, become successful managers and entrepreneurs and so on. Um, it, it, it reminds me, um, you know, when I presented this uh, as what a, a survey must contain, uh, I could see that I was not getting much traction with the audience. So I said, this has actually been translated into more accessible uh, words by Amitabh Bachchan, the great philosopher. Uh, in one of his movies, he said, is movie mein tragedy hai, comedy hai, naach hai, gana hai, dishum dishum bhi hai. I think a survey should have everything like that, and that's what you know, we aspire to do in the economic survey. So this year's economic survey has three uh, parts. One is what we call the perspective, which is all the kind of big picture uh, things. The second is what we call the proximate. I mean, what is happening in the short run? Uh, those are the issues that we dealt with there. And I think two important issues that we discussed, one is, of course, demonetization, on which, of course, you're forbidden to ask questions in the Q&A session. Um, and, and the second one, of course, is, the, uh, is what we call the twin balance sheet problem, the whole what should we do about the banking system, uh, it's two topics. And then we call the persistent is the, you know, the long-run uh, what are the interesting issues for India in the long run? And there, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about one or two. One idea from that, which has also gained a lot of traction, it's something called universal basic income. I mean, can we give all poor Indians a minimum basic, basic living? Uh, what are the pros and cons? It's an issue we discuss. It's, again, been discussed a lot in the press uh, after the economic survey came out. But I'm not going to go into any of these. Um, I'm going to tell you what is very surprising about India. So I'm going to tr tell you eight surprising things about India, uh, which you may not know about. Number one, and this, the inspiration for this chapter is Professor Chinmay uh, Tambe, who's one of the bright young uh, professors here at IIM Ahmedabad. He's done some great work on migration. And you know he helped us. Uh, and drawing from his work, we got hold of some fantastic data. I mean, this data has never been used before from the railways. So we said, we have data now on every passenger who moved from every station to every other station every day for the last 15 years. Uh, think of what the data requirements there are. The Minister of Railways, who's a good friend, was very kind to share this data. And what we found was that, you know, Chinmay's finding is that actually there's a lot more migration in India than you think. What we found using this, so, so, so the metric we used was, what is the you know, net flow of people between two states or two districts on an annual basis uh, in the unreserved category because we wanted to find what is the migration for, I mean, work movement related to work. And so we looked at the unreserved who are more likely to move for work. And what we discovered was that when Chinmay says, you know, there's a lot more than you think, I think uh, the, the, the fresh piece of research said it's even greater than what Chinmay thinks, actually. You know, so uh, I think his estimate was something like four to five to six million Indians move for work every year, our estimate was actually closer to eight to nine millions a year. And that's a lot. Because you know, I study China as well. And to me, what has always struck me about China, one statistic is that on New Year's Day in China, about 300 million people board the train to go back to their village. It's astounding, 25% of the workforce or more. And, and, and the sense, the perception always was, Oh, China is very mobile uh, in terms of people, but India isn't. And it turns out that that's actually not fully true because there's a lot of churn in India as well. And, and the calculation, and those are the you know, satellite-based charts of where the kind of back and forth movements are. You find that eight to nine million people move in India, much more than people ever thought of. So this is kind of a surprising fact number one. 
And this, by the way, has a lot of implications, which I'm going to touch upon at the end, for what it means in terms of disparities between states in India in terms of achieving levels of development. So this was a surprising fact, number one, India on the move and churning. The second fact is, you see, the caricature of India is this, essentially that we are a country where there are so many barriers for, to the movement of goods within India that people had given up on India. This is the caricature of India at these you know, um, uh, crossings, border crossings. You have a line of trucks waiting, and you know, the guy there obviously is extorting. Uh, he's corrupt, he's lazy, and therefore the flow of goods within India is actually not very great. And by the way, that's a caricature as recent as even a few few months ago. I think this is uh, the Economist had a picture of India showing something like this. It turns out that because we had access to data from the tax, indirect tax people, we actually have extremely detailed data. Essentially, every tax transaction of every uh, firm in India, again for the last six seven years, we were able to use that from the tax data to extract data on the flow of goods between states. And what you find is that trade within India, I can move, right? As a share of GDP, which is one measure of trade in India, is about 55, 56%. And it's much greater than you know, many other large countries like Indonesia, Canada, European Union, and not so far off from others as well. So the caricature that India somehow closed internally is actually not true. Uh, it's something, again, I didn't, I didn't know. I thought actually because of all these border barriers between states, you know, the octroi duties, the multiple forms, the multiple registrations, we thought this would, uh, India was very close. It turns out that that's just not the case. And in fact, uh, at a time when the world is becoming so anxious about, you know, the movement of goods across borders, it's very heartening to know that at least within India, the movement of goods within our borders is actually quite good. And you know, I've been involved in the GST uh, discussions on the goods and services tax. It turns out that this is actually also very encouraging because this is happening at a time when we're trying to create you know, one market, one tax, one India via the goods and services tax. So the fact that trade flows within India are so good means I think it bodes very, very well for India that we're a kind of very dynamic nation trading a lot with, it, with each other, with it, with it, with it, with e within ourselves. Um, so that's a second very surprising fact. But to me, this was the most surprising fact, which, you know, I study a lot of trade, and trade is one of my, you know, interests. And the view has always been, with, with justification, that China is a more open economy than India. And the way we measure uh, openness is to measure how much a country exports and imports as a share of its GDP. And it turns out that China, it is true, it was trading much greater than, you know, remember, again, the caricature India is India, socialist, closed, doesn't do trade, you know, ridden with controls at the borders, corrupt uh, cor uh, administration, et cetera, et cetera. And it has been true for the last 25, 30 years that China's trade has been much greater than India's. But lo and behold, after the global financial crisis, we have overtaken China as a nation that trades much more. And this was, came as a complete shock to me because you think of China as, you know, the, 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 the classic country that has grown very rapidly on the basis of trade. It turns out that after the global financial crisis, trade in China plummeted. You know, it's come down enormously, whereas trade in India has been on a steady rise. So maybe at the end of the day, uh, India is the, is the uh, tortoise and China is the hare, and maybe in some long marathon, we're going to come out ahead, and, and that seems to be the case so far. So the fact that India is more open than China was something that I just did not know before I embarked upon this survey. So that's a surprise number three or four, or, uh, if you're counting. The other uh, uh, interesting thing we did in this survey was to get satellite data to try and map urban density. So this is a, a map uh, uh, based on uh, satellite data of China, uh, of Bangalore, or Bangaluru, as a you know, urban agglomeration. The red bits are the uh, built-up bits, and, and the green bits are the non-built-up bits. So what did we do with this data, this source of big data? What we said was, can we approximate 
what is the potential for property tax collection in Bangalore? And we did that. Of course, you, you have to use machine learning techniques. We have a very bright youngster called Parth Kare in my office uh, who's a whiz with these things. And then when he did this very carefully, we did this for Bangalore and we did this for Jaipur as well, we discovered that these two cities are collecting about 5 to 15 percent of the taxes that they should be collecting. And this is probably a conservative estimate of the under collection. So what it shows is that we can use these you know, um, new sources of data and technology actually to improve uh, property tax collection in our cities because it's very important because we also find in the survey that those cities that collect more taxes and actually spend more do in fact end up providing better services to their residents. So, so it's again a, a very exciting possibility that gets thrown up by the fact of you know, being able to use new data and so on. Why, of course, uh, cities don't use this, utilize this potential, why they undercollect is, of course, a very interesting political economy question that I think uh, uh, is worth uh, thinking about uh, going forward. Then, okay, so, so there's, a, uh, th there's, a, uh, there's a background to this chart. So, so when we were thinking about what uh, we should be doing in terms of what are the topics for the survey we should be covering, uh, you know, in the last one year, uh, this concept of a universal basic income, i.e. to provide all citizens with a basic income, a basic standard of living, has been gaining a lot of ground both within India and internationally as well. Uh, Switzerland had a, had a referendum on this. It was rejected. Finland is ex experimenting with this. The United Kingdom is experimenting with it. And uh, uh, maybe it will resonate more with you. Uh, one of these Silicon Valley gurus, is it Peter Thiel or, or Mark Andreessen? Or one of these guys you know, uh, also has come out saying that uh, universal basic income is a must. And they say in the advanced economies, it's going to become very important because if robots replace uh, people for jobs, people won't have jobs, and therefore, you know, we may have to delink income from employment, and so that's a reason to have universal basic income. Of course, in India, the debate is, you know, we need this because there are lots of very poor people. Um, so the question is, is this or is this not a good idea? And uh, so we decided we'd work on this, and then it happened that Professor Tridip Surud, I don't know whether he's here or not, uh, from the uh, ashram, the, the Gandhi ashram here, he invited me to give a talk on you know, what uh, Mahatma Gandhi taught, taught about poverty. And then it struck me, you know, as I was preparing for that, that the, the notion, the concept of a universal basic income is something that would be very interesting to discuss from a Gandhian perspective. Because on the one hand, you know, Gandhiji had this amazing ability to kind of encapsulate the universal human conscience and to say that you know, we have to wipe every tear from every eye. So the universal basic income offered a very accelerated way. You just have to transfer money to people and they get lifted out of poverty. But then a, a, a colleague of mine sent me a quote from Mahatma Gandhi you know, when he, in 1924, how he was completely against giving money away to people without them having to do anything. So Gandhiji was a, was a real moralist as well. So I decided that, you know, uh, so I came and gave a talk at, uh, at the ashram as, you know, a, what would Mahatma Gandhi thought, uh, have thought about universal basic income? So the title of this chapter is in, in, in the survey is called uh, Universal Basic Income, a conversation with and within the Mahatma. Clearly, uh, Gandhiji would have had this torment uh, on this because he was on both sides of the argument. But one of the main attractions of this uh, idea of universal basic income is that today the government already provides a lot of, uh, spends a lot on social programs and on subsidies. And it is generally thought that these programs are not very, very effective in reaching the target audience, namely the poor. I, I, I think, I don't know whether you remember, too many, you're too young, many of you, to remember this, but Rajiv Gandhi famously said that for every one rupee that the Indian government spends, only nine or ten paise uh, reaches the poor. I am sure he was making it up, but, but, but you know, it had a certain resonance 
because we all think of government as being very wa wasteful, inefficient, and so on. So we actually got data on about seven or eight of the major social programs, and we tried to map you know, where all this money was being spent. So on the left-hand side shows where the poor live in India. So the more red the district, the poorer it is. There's many more poor people. And then on the right-hand side, using this data, we said, what is the shortfall of money going to that district, same district in India? It turns out, you can see that the, the color uh, pattern is very similar. So in a sense, the greater the poverty, the greater the inadequacy of the spending that goes to that place, which is, of course, uh, shows that government programs are not very effective uh, at targeting. And so um, uh, the, the interesting thing is that this is intrinsic to the way government has designed its programs. It is not because necessarily because you know Indian government is more inefficient or the state governments are more inefficient. It is just that those state governments that are more efficient will use this money more effectively. And because they're more efficient, they by definition will have fewer poor people. So almost it's kind of, it's, it's a feature built into the system that you're not going to achieve very good targeting in terms of reaching those who most deserve this. So, so, uh, so we showed this evidence. We've actually, actually presented it uh, uh, to the highest uh, circles. And uh, the, the advantage of the universal basic income is that it allows you to overcome this because essentially you, you know, someone sitting somewhere in a state capital or Delhi basically has to transfer money to people's bank accounts or to their mobile phones or when, when all this technology becomes up to date. So it offers a very interesting way of you know, overcoming the problem of weak uh, targeting of government spending. So, uh, um, and of course, we discussed the pros and cons of this. One reason why this idea has to be discussed very carefully is that, uh, and this is why another reason why Gandhiji would have been against it, is that in India, it's very difficult, it's very easy to introduce a new program. But it's very difficult to withdraw existing programs. And the costs of this uh, program are big enough that it cannot be an add-on to all existing programs because the government uh, would just simply would not be able to afford it. The government finances would go bust. And so uh, the trick or the challenge going forward is if this is considered a good idea, if this is considered a good way of you know, eliminating poverty and providing people with a minimum level you know, that they can live with dignity and be you know, entrepreneurial and so on, then um, how can we implement it in a way that is sustainable uh, and that the government can afford. So in fact, after the survey, again, this idea has got a lot of attention, both nationally and internationally, and kind of the world is waiting to see what India, how India is going to follow up on this. So this is one, another very you know, uh, exciting new uh, finding uh, from the economic survey. Now, uh, here I'm going to test your stamina and patience. So, am I boring you? Are, you? are you awake after? Yes? Louder. OK, good, OK, good. Uh, so, so one of the uh, really interesting things about if you know, one of my areas of research is studying economic growth around the world. Now, what you find around the world is that from about 1750 or so, I mean, I'm making the number up, plus or minus 5, 10, 15 years, doesn't matter. Um, what you find is that after the Industrial Revolution, you know, Northern, I mean, West Europe and the United States uh, took off in terms of the standards of living, and all of what is now called the developing world got left behind. That process is called divergence because standards of living diverged between the rich and the poor countries. Now, very interestingly, in the last 25, 30 years, that phenomenon is being reversed i.e., for the first time in about 200 years, we are seeing that finally the poorer countries like China, India, the East Asians, parts of Africa, parts of Latin America, parts of you know, Central Europe are catching up with the advanced countries. We call that process of catching up convergence because they're converging to the standard of living and uh, the opposite process we call divergence. So in the world, essentially trust me when I say that if that line is downward sloping, 
we are seeing a process of convergence. What it essentially says is that the poorer you are, the faster you grow subsequently, and that's how, what allows you to catch up. So this is countries across the world, and you find that in the last 25, 30 years, you know, there's good news for humanity. The poorer countries, so I call, actually call this the golden age for, so when the advanced countries are moaning about, oh, what is going to happen to us, et cetera, et cetera, I say actually this is the golden age for developing countries because you know, in the last 25, 30 years is when we've seen the most rapid improvement in living standards and so on. And this captures that. This captures the same thing within China. Within China, uh, the poorer provinces have started catching up with the richer provinces. So there too, within China, we're seeing a process of equalization and inequalities amongst regions are actually coming down. But what we see in India, exactly the opposite. In the last 15 years, uh, poorer states have been growing on average slower than the richer states. So what that means is that if a state, call it X, you know, any state that I name will get me into trouble. So let's say state number X, it started off in 2000 poorer than a richer state. You would expect it would grow faster, but in fact it's growing slower. So what this means is that disparities within India are actually increasing. Uh, and, and, and this is in sharp contrast to what is happening everywhere in the world. And this, I think, is, uh, you know, we wrote an op-ed based on this recently. To me, it's one of the deepest puzzles about India. Why is it that, and it's a bigger puzzle for another reason. It's a bigger puzzle because, you know, within India, people are moving, trade is happening, and all these things, more trade, more people moving means that actually the opposite should happen because, you know, if Gujarat is growing faster than Orissa, people will come from Orissa to Gujarat so that you will see that Oriya, people from Oriya become, start becoming richer and partaking of what's happening in Gujarat. But that's not happening enough in India, and this is kind of a, a deep, deep puzzle which I was certainly very surprised by uh, when, uh, when I saw this uh, in the data. We all know about the demographic dividend. Uh, I also thought I knew something about the demographic dividend. It turns out that there's something, do people know what the demographic dividend is? E essentially that, um, you know, all countries go through a stage where, um, you know, how many young people there are in the population, it rises and then it falls over time. So that, you know, in the rising phase is when you get all the economic dynamism. In the declining phase, you have many, many more elderly people, and so the task of looking after them. So the number of productive people to dependent people, that ratio changes over time. And that has very important implications for how economies grow. So is one of the striking statistical regularities is that all the East Asian countries, South Korea, China, Indonesia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the, Japan, you know, the boom that they had after World War II coincided very strongly with this, you know, the share of the working age to non-working age population rising very sharply. Uh, that's when they grew very rapidly. Now, India is very unusual in the sense that we are also on our, you know, demographic dividend phase when this is rising, but ours has been much gentler than these countries. So both the dividend going up is going to be gentler, and also the decline is going to be gentler. And so we have a very unusual pattern of demographic dividend. Uh, so how that's going to affect our growth is also going to be somewhat different from what happened elsewhere. Now, it turns out that within India, there's a huge difference. Uh, we are like, from a demographic point of view, we are like two Indias. We have an India which comprises Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and West Bengal, an exception. They are like some of the advanced countries. They're like countries which have started to become older and older. Many more old people in these states than young people. And so we have one India, which is peninsular India, which resembles the advanced countries in terms of their age structure. And then we have what used to be called Bimaru India, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, uh, uh, Rajasthan, Odisha, which are much more young and dynamic. So we have two Indias here. And so this is going to be a huge challenge and an opportunity because the, uh, the, the demographic dividend means that we are going to be very dynamic because of this, 
But then soon there are states in India that are going to start aging, and they will need people from the other parts of India to look after their elderly and their aging. So in a sense, we may need more migration in India just so that young demographic India of the Bimaru states actually migrates more in order to look after the aging population of some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the older aging states. The other thing we discovered is that this window of opportunity that we call the demographic dividend is going to you know, close very soon. We estimate that around 2020 is when we'll reach the peak of the demographic dividend. And after that, you know, the growth boom from having so many young people will start declining very gradually and very soon. So what this means is that it's a kind of wake up call to all policymakers to say, we have this window of opportunity. We have to do the most uh, that we can. Um, <clears throat> last, uh, I'm going to end with this because I think uh, we'll take some questions after this. So one of the things that uh, we have to, uh, well, we have to do in our job is to deal with these ratings agencies. I mean, these ratings agencies come and say, how good is India? I mean, they, li they literally are rating agencies. They rate us compared to other countries on a, a number of parameters, and then they say, you know, they give us a grade. It's like your surprise quiz that you're going to get tomorrow. Uh, uh, full disclosure, I know nothing about the surprise quiz tomorrow. I'm just making it up. But I think that uh, uh, these rating agencies come and say, you know, India is uh, B minus, uh, other countries A minus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Big Short. Yeah? Or how many of you have read the book Big Short? Ah, that's very good. It's, 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 I think it's the gr best book on the global financial crisis. It's the most insightful book for a number of reasons we can talk about. But one of the things that came out from this uh, 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 book, of course, is that the rating agencies had a big role to play in the crisis because essentially, you know, assets uh, that were, you know, in themselves, I mean, I can't use the word, pretty rubbish, once they were packaged with other assets, they were rated as, you know, A. And so the rating agencies were routinely rating toxic assets much better than they deserve to be. And the movie Big Shot basically is about these three, four guys who knew what these underlying assets were worth and had the courage and the deep pockets to stick with it in the face of you know, complete overwhelming you know, forces on the other side. You know, how, do you, how can you defer with the ratings agencies? They are saying it's, it's AAA. Who are you to come and say it's not that? But they waited, and in the end, they proved to be right. right? So that's, uh, so that's one aspect of what the rating agencies did very badly. In the, in the, in the uh, economic survey, what we show is that uh, 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 it's, it's a, I don't, hope all of you got the pun. We call this poor standards because one of the biggest rating agencies is standard and poors. Uh, and basically, we accuse them of saying they have lousy standards for judging how good or bad countries are. And, and uh, uh, the evidence we show is that we, we sort of compare their rating for China, which is you know, almost top quality, and for India, it's barely investment grade. So you see that there's a six or seven level difference in, in the ratings given by this to India and China. But these rating agencies are meant to assess risk. And it turns out that over the period that we show here, China's growth decelerated rapidly, and the biggest risk factor that we all know precedes financial crisis is the amount of credit in the economy, and that's been growing gangbusters. I mean, the, the credit increase in China ha is, has grown at an unprecedentedly alarming rate. And despite that, and despite the fact that in India growth has generally gone up and credit has basically remained flat, so on a risk basis, if you looked at these two charts, you would say, wow, India is less risky than China. But in fact, the ratings agencies rate in China much higher. And also, they have not changed China's ratings, despite the fact that risks have gone up so much. So uh, in the economic survey, what we say is that you know, don't take these guys too seriously, because standard and poor's has pretty poor standards. Um, uh, so uh, I, I could uh, carry on and on and uh, exhaust you, but also exhaust myself. 
uh, but I hope I've given you a flavor of what are, what are the surprises of the Indian economy. Uh, I would urge uh, the economics professors to make the survey compulsory reading in all courses, um, and also in non-economic courses. And you know, uh, <laughs> so um, so uh, thank you all for your patience in listening to me. Uh, I'd be delighted to take questions. Yeah, thank you. Questions, please. We have uh, mics in the audience. <laughs> Just raise your hand and uh, introduce yourselves. And uh, of course, the first hand, Professor Mote, you don't need to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed listening to you. But I'm not a macroeconomics man. I'm basically a macro man. I'm impressed by what Upadhyay uh, said. Uh, Upadhyay says, Yatra Pinde that something else. It says, if it is in the microsome, it is in the microsome. Now, fortunately, BJP is in power, but because I have mentioned somebody from RSS, Adil would have called the police and had me arrested. Fortunately, I am not. So now, this is what we have to see. What disturbed me today was an ad by uh, Times of India about dishwasher being announced by American company. Boss. Now look at the white goods. Refrigerators. All Samsung. Uh, take anything else. All uh, Koreans. Cars. All uh, Koreans. So where is our company to age? Where? Now we are saying that uh, make in India. Make what? Now, what is the reason? Why is not, we are not able to compete? We, are, we were only two cars long ago. They are gone now. All the cars are with Hyundai. And uh, I think rather than Tata is trying to make Jag Jaguar and all that. But we are nowhere there. And now agriculture, all over the world, only 3% of the population works on agriculture. Rest works in India. Here, it is the other way around. Now, what's the reason for that? Now, what I was looking for answers to this, that how can we remedy this quickly? Uh, why is India lacking in competitiveness? Is it something wrong with our education? Are our IITs and IIMs not delivering? What is the reason? Now, these are something which we would like. I was seeking answers to in your economic survey. Why was this not happening? So, so uh, firstly, Professor Mote, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and uh, to the extent that I'm not able to answer this, I'm going to blame you for not teaching me well enough. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so so, so, so you are responsible for my ignorance, which I'm going to uh, reveal just now. But, but it's a great question. I mean, it's a broader question that, you know, why has India not been able to, you know, compete uh, with the world, especially in the manufacturing sector? And, and that's kind of broadly the... Uh, now, <clears throat> it's, it's a very rich question, and, and I think it's, it's, uh, one needs probably... Uh, at least 20, 20 economic surveys to answer that question. Uh, but let me just take a stab at this by saying that to give a historical perspective on this, I want to give a historical perspective. I think that a combination of what we inherited and the choices that we made early on uh, were very inimical to the development of manufacturing. You know, we had this huge public sector. We had all these controls. And then we also had policies like industrial licensing, so that even our entrepreneurs early on did not have you know, uh, the ability and the freedom to do what they could. I mean, all of you, I mean, I, I, I hate to say this, but if you remember the Bombay Club, uh, uh, there's some very illustrious people on that. Maybe some of them are patrons of IIM Ahmedabad as well. Uh, 
they argued for a protectionist uh, uh, stance, a very inward looking stance before independence. And we pretty much followed that. And we kind of put further, further burdens on our entrepreneurs. Now, when you combine that with the fact that some basic things that the state had to do, the government had to do, like providing infrastructure, providing education, health, and education not IITs and IIMs, but you know, basic education to our poor. The Indian state did not do that. So it's no surprise that a combination of not having you know, the basic services that states provide and stifling entrepreneurship through all these controls, you put two, these, two, these two things together, it's no surprise at all. Because remember, China, until 1979, it also stifled the private sector. But even in that period, the dark period of China between you know, 49 and 79, the Chinese state was providing very good health, very good education, and because it was so capable, it was very good at building infrastructure as well. So now we are trying to undo uh, you know, a lot of things that we didn't do right in the past. And it's a, it's historically, it's a huge challenge. We're trying to undo you know, 30, 40 years of you know, development policy and experience. And so uh, you know, going forward, uh, we have to try our best. Uh, will we succeed? I mean, uh, the jury is out, remains to be seen. But meanwhile, what happened, of course, is precisely because of Professor Mote, we had these IIMs, we had a dynamic services IT sector, and that service sector boomed. So we've had a very lopsided pattern of development, but very much related to the choices we made. Some good, you know, the services sector took off. Some bad, manufacturing never became competitive. But in fact, now what I worry going forward is, is that even the, the dynamism and, and, and the buzz and the entrepreneurship that we have, even in the services sectors, even that we may be in danger of, of losing because we're not producing enough skilled people in India to keep up that you know, dynamism of you know, uh, a relatively cheap skilled labor, which is our advantage, even that. So we need to keep that up as well so that at least our services sector can be as dynamic as it has been in the past and to some extent make up for the fact that our manufacturing, for all these historical reasons, uh, didn't do as well as we should have. May I disagree for you? Yeah, please, yeah. Arvind, government after government has been obsessed. I'm, I'm Dangaj from 72 batch. Uh, government after government has been talking about black money, flow of money outside of the country, and then they've been talking about corruption. And this has been probably, you know, so the dominant uh, feature that we have all been talking about. Can't, you know, say your team come up with a white paper on black economy. Can it not capture the financial architecture of the world as it is existing now? That, I think, you know, so will probably make the things clearer to us in terms of making our strategic decisions. So, uh, uh, what do we do about black money? I, I think Errol has done a lot of work on black money. Uh, I think you should consult him. He's the, he's the expert on black money and gold. I mean, he certainly knows more about it than I do. Uh, for, uh, no, see, I, I think that when you think about black money, I, I think you should think about this first in terms of the stock of black money, you know, whatever there is, illicit. So, so remember, black money, one should be clear, has two kind of dimensions. One is money that's made from prohibited illegal activities, you know, gambling, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera, crime. And then you have uh, the other aspect of black money, which it could have also been, been made legally, but it's not disclosed to the tax authorities. That's also black money. So let's keep these things clearly in mind. Obviously, we don't want to have illegal criminal activity. Uh, that's bad, but you know, so, so the first thing is that, what is black money? And then there's the stock of black money. And then there's the flow of black money, i.e., what is it about our system that keeps generating this black money, right? So I think we should focus a lot more on the flow than going after the stock. You know, you, we should also try and do whatever. So when you think about the flow of black money, you have to say, what is it that leads to, you know, it could be high taxes, it could be corrupt, you know, tax administration, 
It could be an over, uh, uh, entrepreneurs overburdened with regulation. Uh, it could be a whole host of factors. And I think we need to work on all of these. You know, if you look at the latest budget, for example, it reduced the tax rates for uh, people in the 10% income tax bracket to 5%. It has uh, tried to incentivize new taxpayers to come into the system. It's reduced the corporate tax rate also for small and medium enterprises. So I think a whole lot needs to be done to arrest the flow of black money. And that's where now our focus should be. After having done demonetization, I think, I think we should, that's, that's what we should focus on. But it's not going to be easy. It's, it's going to take a, a lot of time. It's going to need sticks. It's going to need carrots. Uh, and, and, and you know, so all these things have to be done to check the flow of black money. <clears throat> Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, here. Yeah, please. Yeah, hi. I'm Umang Shah. I'm a PGP1 student here. Sir, you talked about the universal basic income. You're talking about it probably as a substitute for the Mandrega program, I guess. That's, that's probably... So, vis-a-vis -vis the Mandrega, what advantage does the universal basic income provide? So, I look at it as if that it's reducing an incentive for a person to work. Also, Mandrega does indulge in product, uh, I mean, uh, production of some productive assets. So, wouldn't the universal basic income kind of reduce the incentive for people to work? So, what's the advantage of this over the Mandrega? So, so, so a, a very good question. In, in fact, this is what uh, Mahatma Gandhi also uh, felt that uh, he, he said it's, it's a crime to, to give people money without them, you know, contributing something to society. So, so the ar arguments against uh, for and against are the following, right? With Enrega, uh, and and you know what what the map tried to show was that, uh, supposing you have you know, hundred rupees, and you want this hundred to reach the most deserving, right? That all of it should go to the poor and the deserving. When you set up something like an uh, Manrega program, what happens is that the most deserving don't necessarily get it because it is mediated through various levels of government. And there's leakage, there's rent seeking. And as I said, you, you look at the Andrega program, the states that use it most effectively are states like Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, which have fewer poor than UP and Bihar. And that's going to be intrinsic to Andrega, right? Now, but you have a good point on the other side that is there a danger that if you give, after all, Manrega is, it's money for work. And that's the appeal that you're highlighting. Uh, what about money without work? And here, I think that, you know, I don't want to get into uh, uh, broader ethical issues and so on. But if you look, just look at the evidence on this, on this which is that um, there have been pilots of this income in Madhya Pradesh and places. There is absolutely no evidence that you give people money that you know, they will you know, just squander it and so on. So it's a slightly, see, it's an empirical issue. Also, if you were to give the money to the women, for example, there's even less risk that the money would be squandered. And so my, you know, there are many ways in which you can implement this. But one very attractive way of doing this would be to give a universal basic income just to women. Uh, you know, so people like you and me who might otherwise go and buy a bottle of beer with the universal basic income, I mean, there's less of a risk that the woman would do that. So I think that there are various ways of you know, trying to address the kind of concerns that you raise. And it is doable, and it is you know, kind of implementable. The big advantage being you don't get the leakage that you get with all these other government programs. Oh, hey. uh, <clears throat> Rajiv, PGP 96. Uh, in one of the slides, you talked about the concept of uh, convergence and divergence, and you mentioned that India is, uh, as an economy, is a very divergent economy compared to the other countries like China, etc. What are the key reasons for this? See, I, 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 let me try and provide, I think, uh, one or two reasons for this. Um, and these are just hypotheses. These are not things that I've... I think one possibility is that there are actually governance traps. That is that, you see, what is the theory behind this? The theory behind this is that if a state is poor, wages will be much lower, and therefore capital will be attracted there to take advantage of the cheap labor and then boost that place up. But what if places with cheap labor are those also with terrible governance? 
then it doesn't matter that you have cheap labor because there will be no power, there will be no this, there will be corruption. So on a risk-adjusted basis, it's not a very attractive place uh, to do business. So that's one, one possibility. See, even as I say this, it's not a very, you shouldn't accept it, it's not a completely satisfactory answer because if it is the case that there are these governance traps, why isn't there an incentive for these states to improve? I mean, politically, if because of this people are leaving or capital is not coming in, politicians in that state, in order to you know, uh, win elections, would, you would think, would say, you know, we have to change this. And that's, I mean, it has been happening to a greater extent recently. I think states with good governance are getting reelected more, but it's clearly and evidently not happening fast enough or often enough for this basic trend to be, uh, you know, uh, arrested. Uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Sarthak. I'm a PGP1 student here. My question was regarding uh, UBI. I had a couple of concerns there, similar to what Umang asked. But one thing that I was uh, worried about is that are we uh, using the UBI? Will we be able to uh, uh, introduce the behavioral change that uh, other schemes were able to introduce, like the midday meal scheme that were that was able to encourage parents and children to go to school and then have their meals? Also, the uh, NREGA was mainly responsible, uh, also uh, responsible for raising the rural wages. And uh, one more thing that it, this, uh, the expenditure is esti estimated to be about four to five percent of GDP. And, you, you've uh, read the economic survey, I noticed. <laughs> yes, sir. and also uh, at the this stage, we are uh, trying to attract investment opportunities from abroad, and uh, we stand very high on the macroeconomic value index. So. Do you think that introducing this scheme now would hurt our investment prospects also? Would we be able to generate the same behavioral change that we intended to generate from other schemes? So I, I, I know I'm in Gujarat because of this kind of strong, I, I would call, Baniya mentality of thinking that, you know, uh, if you give people money, they will squander it. Uh, um, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit harsh. Uh, I think it's a bit of an elitist uh, concern. I think if you're at 50 rupees a day income uh, and you go and tell that person, you know, if you get 50 rupees more, I worry because you will squander it. Uh, I, I, I think that whole thinking is a little bit dangerous because you don't know at 50 rupees, uh, you know, if you're at subsistence, you know, uh, to be denied this <laughs> amount of money because some, some, elitist, uh, some elites think that you will squander it. You have to be a bit careful of that kind of thinking. Huh? This, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's an empirical question, but I think you have to be a little bit careful on that. But the other, other point that you raise is a very good one. Can we afford it? You know, we, we have this, you know, we are macroeconomically stable. We want to continue to do so because investment will come in. That is why we say very clearly uh, that the only way that this is going to be feasible going forward is if it replaces existing programs. You cannot have a program that costs 4 to 5 percent of GDP and have it as a new additional program because it simply won't fly. Uh, and there you're absolutely right. So we have to, but the difficulty of course is that in India it's very difficult to create a program, it's very difficult to withdraw an existing one uh, because the losers always are much more active than those who gain. So I, I think there's a tendency that what you get you pocket, what you lose you say, oh my god, you know, I've lost, I've lost, I've lost. So, so and, no, and it's not it, it's, it's real, it's true, you know, behavioral economists do point out this fact that how we behave towards gains and losses is very asymmetric. If you read Daniel Kahneman and the Nobel Prize winners, th think fast, think slow, it's kind of a very important political economy point. So we have to over deal with that and, and overcome that, otherwise it's going to become uh, difficult to sustain and implement. Um, good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah. I'm Suyash, a PGP2 student. So this is about uh, the convergence uh, and divergence slide. So uh, there could be two re uh, more reasons why we are facing divergence. One would be the, the synergies which urban centers have, and that's, hence they attract more business. Uh, so my question on this is that are we, uh, are this, are, uh, is the divergence because we still have synergies, or are we losing on uh, the synergies as in they are becoming dissynergies? The second part is uh, about uh, that the divergence could also be because of some, uh, because, can be explained by Lewis model, uh, which says that if you have unlimited labor supply in the rural area, you will uh, have subsistence wages at, at urban as well as rural area, uh, areas. So building on that, 
is the di will the divergence change once the unlimited supply as we see it or the large supply of labor we have uh, decreases after some time? You see, uh, 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 a very good question. I, I know I'm in a management school when I hear the word synergy. I, I've never heard that. I've not heard that for a long time. It's wonderful to hear that word. Uh, I don't know what it means, by the way, but uh, I'll try and I'll try and. Uh, 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 so so let, let me take your first question, your second question first. Huh? I think the point you make about the the Lewis curve and you know and so on. See, the, the, the difficulty with that line of reasoning is that we're not trying to explain why the average level of wage is not rising. You know, uh, the, the, the Lewis curve says that basically uh, you're going to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, wages determined by subsistence, et cetera, et cetera. But here we're trying to understand how the regional pattern is, it, it, it varies across states. Um, so, so if you had Lewis everywhere, I mean, wages shouldn't rise everywhere, right? It's all be subsistence. But what we are seeing is, in fact, rapid increases in wages in some parts and standards of living, but not so in other parts. And that pattern is actually quite anomalous because what you expect to see is that those places where wages are already very high, the subsequent growth of wages should be slower. So it's that differential pattern rather than the absolute level of Lewis wages that, that you're trying to explain. Uh, so, so, so that's why I think the Lewis thing, which is an, an interesting idea, probably doesn't quite you know, fit the facts uh, here in India. Uh, and, and by the way, in China, you've had a Lewis curve for 30 years, and, and you've started to see you know, the same pattern of convergence. So even uh, empirically, there, there does seem to be something somewhat special about India, which is making this. On the uh, synergy and lack of synergy question, um, I, I see... The fact that there are urban centers uh, in India and that they attract um, people, you know, I've not really thought through what this implies for, for uh, divergence and convergence. It's just that I feel that, you know, in China we've had similar urbanization. We had more rapid urbanization, and that's not come in the way of, you know, people's standards of living, you know, catching up all over the country, you know. So, so, the, so the regional variation. Uh, can't, I think, be explained completely by, you know, urbanization per se, because, you know, uh, China is, if, if anything, more urbanized than, than India is. So that's what, uh, but we have to look more into this question. It's a very good question. Last question. Yes, and uh, I will take this chance. Th there's not been, uh, I think there's been tremendous gender bias in the questions, yes. and we need this. Second, second last question. Uh, second last question. And I also want to talk about this <coughs> demographic dividend. I'm from the first batch, 64, 66, and I noticed that the PGP ones have an advantage over me. They were able to ask questions I was not. So oh, so <laughs> we, we've come a long way. Yeah, so this is the demographic dividend. The younger people the, get I better I think it's the demogra democratic dividend, I think. <laughs> okay, great. My, my point is about this unemployment uh, figures. Uh, I read that every month, about a million people, million Indians join the workforce. And uh, is there any reliable source of finding out what is the rate of unemployment all over India-wise? Because I read about uh, American unemployment, it has gone down from 10% to 5%, whatever. And there is a regular update on that. Do we have any source of information as to how much is the current rate uh, unemployment and how much is it going down or going up or whatever? And my second question is, as an economist, do you see any economic justification in this idea of bullet train between Ahmedabad and Bombay? You can clap for that. <laughs> you know, um, I, I have to say, uh, I know very little about Gujarat. I know even less about bullet trains. So you put the two together, I know nothing about this. Uh, um, so, but on the, on, the, on the unemployment question, I think that, uh, <clears throat> you see, unemployment data in India, employment, unemployment data, wages data, is, is still, I think we need to improve that tremendously. I think we do have uh, a difficulty uh, monitoring this on a high frequency basis. We get these, we have these surveys done kind of periodically, sometimes once every five years, sometimes once every two years, and some things that we do on a more high frequency basis the scope is more narrow. 
So it's always difficult in India to get a really good picture of the employment and unemployment situation. The best we have is a new set of surveys which the Labor Department produces. We've been doing five, six rounds of that. But I think we're still trying to improve the methodology of that. But I think Manish Sabarwal of you know, Team Lease makes a very good point that I think what he says is that in India, you know, the notion of employment and unemployment are kind of really difficult to measure. And, and I think, uh, therefore, it's much more, I think, important to look at the quality of employment in India rather than unemployment. Because basically, most people find something to do. Uh, you know, but, but what do they do? do? They're not in the formal sector. It's not high productive jobs. It's often in the service sector, very little in manufacturing. So I think it's that kind of employment profile that we need to be looking at and targeting our policies uh, you know, at rectifying. Last question from, yeah, please. I am Piyusha Bharat, PGP1. So, so in your economic survey, you talked about the last mile concerns for the UBI scheme. Uh, like if, if we consider the distance uh, from a bank for uh, average distance and uh, number of banks per people, so still. No, no, we can hear you. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so still, a lot of people don't have proper access to banks. So that is a major difficulty for implementing the UBI scheme. So uh, how do you uh, gonna address about that? And second question: uh, Recently, uh, UK and Switzerland rejected the idea of UBI. So what are the differences that you think will make it work in, in India and it did not, uh, couldn't work there? Yeah, uh, 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 very, very good questions. Um, see, I, I think I, I touched upon the second question that certainly in the United States and advanced countries, the notion of a universal basic income is being more and more seen as a response to the onslaught of technology on jobs. You know, I mean, robots, et cetera, et cetera, coming in. Uh, what is happening is that employment possibilities are coming down, and increasingly there's deformalization of labor markets, i.e., people who had permanent jobs, formal sector jobs, are getting more part time jobs than informal jobs. So, universal basic income is being seen as a response to that development. Uh, in India, of course, the motivation is uh, uh, less about you know, the variability of rights, about just people not having a basic minimum income to lead you know, meaningful, productive lives. I mean, you know, if you don't have you know, a, a basic income, there's not very much else you can do. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Bertolt Brecht, a great playwright, playwright, said, first food, then morals. You know, so we need that before we uh, do some of the higher stuff. I, I think that, uh, but your question about do we have the last mile problem solved, the financial infrastructure, Again, it's a very good question. The, we are still, we are, you know, despite Jandhan and everything, we're still you know, far away from getting a perfect financial inclusion. I think we made, we've made a lot of progress in the last two and a half, three years with, with JAM, you know, Jandhan, Aadhaar, and mobile. I, and I think the possibility of making strides in that are far more uh, uh, optimistic than we can in improving Endrega or things like that. So for example, uh, now you have this UPI, the Unified Payment Interface, where now mobile can become a real effective means of financial things. I, I mean, I don't want to oversell this because the shocking statistic is that about 35 crore people in India neither have a smartphone nor have a regular phone. So for them, you know, even, so for them, this is, your question is very valid. So, but I do think we can make uh, rapid progress on that in the next few years and reach a level of this jam architecture which is sufficient to be able to implement uh, the universal basic income idea. Thank you very much. Sir. Arvind, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to have you back on the campus. 36 years, you said, so that's like Huge divergence. <laughs> I think we need a bullet train from Delhi to Ahmedabad. Uh, it's really been a pleasure uh, to listen to you about all the surprises. Frankly, when you started out, I was a little worried because you said, you quoted Keynes, who said, you know, think in symbols, speak in words. You did that fantastically. But the quote ended, you know, 
be as close to the earth as politicians. I got a little worried. And then I found the last surprise. You use satellite data to look at the earth. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Please, it's your institute. Please keep coming back. And we look forward to having you here more often. Thank you.